for anti-aging, I really love um, vitamin K2. And this is not one that's often talked about for that reason, but I'll tell you why I love it and why I think it's super, super important. So one reason is because vitamin D3 is so big these days and they are considering adding it to the food supply for you know everyone so pretty much you're not going to be able to avoid it whether you like it or not and it's one of the most maybe possibly now actually the most consumed vitamin uh, supplement throughout the world so why am i talking about vitamin d3 when i said vitamin k2 because of this so we're talking about feeling younger right that's fundamentally our focus here and so what is the process of aging now obviously we've talked about this before i'd like to do a really long episode about this at some point and there's a lot of different things that are part of the whole process aging process but one of the things from a very practical point of view that i think we can all relate to as you get older is you get stiffer and you get drier <laughs> right so your highest water content is going to be when you're a newborn baby your lowest water content is when you're going to be elderly or you know as old as you get before you die basically so one way of looking at it is that the aging process is like a shriveling process and in fact um you know from in terms of how you look in terms of looking younger this is one of the key components as well right the drier that you get the older that you look so and I talked about feeling stiff, right? Stiff joints, stiff back, you know, like, oh, you're going to, uh, it's difficult to get up, all of that kind of stuff, right? So what's all that down to? Well, there's one theory that says, and there's a lot of evidence supported, which I'll go over, that one of the main things that um, ages you is the process of calcification. So and specifically calcification of the tissues. So calcium, if you ever like, think of chalk, right? Um, like blackboard chalk. I'm sure we've all had experience of chalk in some way or another, right? So this is a, a dry, uh, a drying kind of substance, right? You rub it on your hand, it, it's gonna feel dry afterwards. In fact, people use it for that reason, right? Like with pool or snooker or whatever, chalk is gonna um, uh, dry your skin okay so it's a drying substance so what happens is with the calcium that we take into our bodies if we have more than a certain amount the the, the remember i said uh, earlier that our body wants to keep a very strict amount of certain things in our blood magnesium is one of them one other thing that a body wants to keep a very very tight balance of in the blood is calcium all the electrolytes really calcium magnesium pot uh, potassium phosphorus chloride the reason why seeing if you have a deficiency of any of those things just by testing blood is often pointless is because your body will keep the pretty much exact same amount in the blood except for in extreme medical cases so you, anyway your body keeps that calcium in the blood at a very um, specific range and that's because the body is trying to keep the ph the acid alkaline balance in a very specific range and calcium is the most alkalizing um, element and so if there's too much calcium what the body immediately does is takes it out of the uh, uh, blood and it puts but it puts it into storage in nearby tissues rather than putting it into the bones, which is where we would ideally want it, unless there's a certain factor at play, which we'll go about to talk about. And so there's a lot of evidence that says that the process of getting older is just the process of calcification. Now, let's give a few examples. Asphalosclerosis, which ultimately leads cardiovascular disease and can ultimately lead to heart attack or a stroke, is a buildup of calcium as well as cholesterol. Um, those are the two main things in the arteries, right? This is a very dangerous situation if it's allowed to continue. The reasons for that, we talked about that in a separate episode, the cardiovascular episode, so I won't go into that again. Um, but it's not the only place that your body builds up calcium. And as I said, that's kind of like, first of all, your body will try and deposit it into your tissues. So it can deposit it into uh your joints and tendons and that is where a person will have osteopro uh, sorry that's where a person will have arthritis and bone spurs and stuff like that right if you take a um 
uh, an x-ray you actually see this kind of like lumps on the like hard lumps of calcium on the bones of where they're supposed to be if you go and see a chiropractor often they'll talk about how the vertebrae of the spine which are very crucial start to um like uh, calcify and like the space between them is less and they start to become more rigid and all the rest of it um if the calcium builds up in the liver or the gallbladder we refer to that as gallstones if the calcium builds up in the um, kidneys sorry i meant gallbladder right? if the calcium builds up in the kidneys then we refer to that as kidney stones if the calcium builds up on uh, in the brain we refer to that as alzheimer's disease so if we often you know refer to it as plaque but what is plaque plaque has a strong uh, calcium component calcium is one of the main ingredients and then yeah as much as you want calcium on your teeth you don't want calcium on your teeth in the form of plaque right so that's the uh, that's the minimum that people have heard of right but there's actually other areas where that calcium builds up and causes problems as well and there is a theory that a lot of the aches and pains of the bodies are caused by that calcium buildup okay the more vitamin d3 you consume and this is especially more true if it's consumed through food than if it comes from sunlight for complicated reasons that I probably won't get into now. The more vitamin D, D3 you consume, well, any form of vitamin D, including vitamin D3 you consume, the more calcium you absorb from food. That's one of the main mechanisms that it has. I remember I read a great book because I tried um, very high doses of vitamin D3 a while ago. And one of the books I read on the subject was like how to take high dose vitamin D3 and not die. <laughs> That's literally the title of the book. Um, something very close to that. It certainly said, you know, how to not die while doing it. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting, like the same thing that they put in vitamin D3 um, supplements is the same thing that they actually put in one form of rat poison. So a very high dose of vitamin D3 is dangerous i think everyone knows this this is not like you know super super uh, uh, esoteric information or whatever that the, there is a limit to how much you can take of all the fat soluble vitamins before it starts to cause a problem vitamin a we talked about in a separate episode in detail we're talking a little bit about uh, vitamin d right now um and then vitamin e is not as bad as those two but there is evidence that too much of it um definitely is not good and so that's so the more vitamin D we have, the more calcium we're absorbing, the more calcium that's going to end up on our bloodstream, and therefore the more that is going to be deposited in the tissues if your body deems it to be an excessive amount. So how do you get around that? Well, that book that I uh, referred to earlier, one of the recommendations they make is if you're doing very high dose of vitamin D3, minimize your calcium intake right don't eat as much so that is something to look at but generally calcium is actually very beneficial so long as it's not doing what i just said so long as it's not going to the wrong place in fact it is absolutely crucial literally every cell of your body needs calcium in order to function it is absolutely one of those things that if you could wave a magic wand and remove the calcium in someone's body they would drop dead within minutes it's you know as important as oxygen for every cell of the body to function so calcium is a really crucial thing there's all kinds of issues that can come when you have too much phosphorus in comparison to calcium uh, there's a lot of phosphorus in animal food there's a lot of phosphorus really a lot of phosphorus in most of the soda drinks that people have phosphoric acid so for the normal person to be like oh i'm gonna really reduce my calcium intake is a dangerous and a bad idea from my perspective so what do we do? We want the benefits of high, of, you know, good amount of vitamin D3. We want the benefits of the calcium. How do we prevent this happening? And that brings us back to our friend, vitamin K2, and why I said it's, you know, such a great recommendation for anti-aging because it stops that process. Well, that's one of the two main reasons. The other, because it stops that process of you basically slowly turning into a dry, hard living statue because your tissues are getting calcified by that excess calcium um, coming in. Now, there is a nutrient that will stop this happening to some degree. Um, and we'll talk about the degree in a sec and it's called vitamin k2 
Vitamin K2 is a fascinating thing. It is not easy to get enough from diet. Vitamin K2 is similar to vitamin B12 in one particular way, which is it's actually only the product of fermentation. So vitamin B12, the reason why it's higher in animal food is just because the animal animal food has the bacteria and the bacteria create the vitamin B12. It's the same thing um, with uh, uh, the most active form of vitamin K2. Um, there is some vitamin K2 that's actually in the animal as well, but it's generally not enough to be optimal. So generally, you always have it as a product of fermentation. Um, it So the benefit is it stops that calcium building up in the tissues, but what else does it do? It takes it out of the tissues and puts it into the bones and to some degree as well, the teeth. So it makes your teeth harder and it makes your bones stronger. Why is that a beneficial thing? Well, again, if we're talking about anti-aging, one of the issues about being old is that you're stiff and dry, but the other issue about being old is that you're fragile, right? That you, your bones break more easily, which is extremely limiting to the quality of life, right? Once you've had a hip break or something like that, it's... Yeah, I think, what is it? The falls become the most dangerous thing after a certain age for people? Absolutely. If you navigate everything well and do all the other stuff that <laughs> uh, we and other people recommend and, you, you know, you live to that grand old age, then that is one of the main threats that you're going to have um, is, uh, is a fall. And I think I've seen something like, I uh, just saw the other day, 20% of men die uh, within a year of having a fall. Mm. Um, after a certain age, I can't remember the age, after maybe 70, 80, something like that. So um, it, it's really debilitating. So something that pulls the ca calcium out of your tissues where you don't want it and puts it in your bones and teeth where you do want it, that's a fantastic thing. The, f the more D3 you have, the more K2 you need. S loads of people are taking D3 at the moment. They're about to like add it to your food, whether you want to take it or not. So we need to be aware of vitamin K2. So that's why uh, I would consider it one of the most important and overlooked and underrated and that's, nutrients. That's a really great point because obviously if that is coming into the food, we are taking it, then we potentially may need to be externally supplementing with the K2 so that we can avoid the calcification and avoid those things that you just mentioned. Yes. So then with the K2, what would be the best form to take? Yeah, good question. So first of all, K2, not K1, has these benefits we talked about. K1 is more to do with clotting. Um, it's That's also an important thing to support clotting. Um, internal bleeding is you know, a significant thing that affects some people. Some people worry if you take a lot of K2, will it mean you clot too much? All the research says no. It supports clotting, but it doesn't increase clotting. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so K2 is the form that you want. There's a, all kinds of different K2s in food, actually. You have MK4, um, MK5, MK6, MK7, MK8, MK9. Commercially, in terms of supplement form, you basically have two. You have MK4 or MK7. Both of them are interesting. Um, there's not enough research into this. I just want to clarify that. So, but I'll tell you what I understand is known. MK7 is generally considered to be the more powerful of the two. MK7 comes from fermentation. If you really are against supplements, you can have a decent amount of MK7 uh, by consuming something called natto, which is a Japanese fermented food. There is some degree of it in other fermented food that hasn't been pasteurized as well, but natto is really the uh, big one. Um, then there's the other form called MK4. MK4 is more the type that's found in animals. Um, now, the interesting thing about MK4 version is that in Japan, they actually have a licensed drug, pharmaceutical drug, which is basically just a very high dose of MK4 vitamin K2. So usually the amount of vitamin K2 that you would have is... 200 400 600 micrograms something like that that's a good supplement dose but what if you're taking loads of vitamin d3 what if you think you're already very calcified you know can you have a higher dose there's no research that shows that having like way more mk7 is beneficial and there's actually not the research to even show that it's safe but there is the research to show with the mk4 that it's safe so um 
the dose that they give of that is 45 milligrams, which another way of saying it is 45,000 micrograms. So as I said, maybe your average multivitamin or whatever is two, 300 micrograms. <clears throat> they're giving, <clears throat> of this other form, they're giving 45,000 micrograms a day over the course of years, and they see no detrimental effect from it. So that's very interesting, right? That that's possible. As I say, the more common these days version MK7, there's nothing saying that you can have that much and that it's safe. Why would you want to have that much? Maybe you wouldn't, right? Maybe you want to you know, go the more safe and easy route and go the MK7. That's the type that we have available. But if you really wanted to seriously go at the um, decalcification thing, maybe you've taken loads of D3 and you hadn't realized this, whatever, um, then you could consider that other form of vitamin K2 in a large dose. I personally did an experiment with this, um, which was poorly timed. <laughs> Um, because uh, I took that dose that I just said, which is proving to be safe, and it was totally safe. It did not cause any issues, except when I went to have a tooth extraction of this tooth that's been bothering me for 20 years, I finally decided enough is enough. And um, it took the dentist an hour to get it out, whereas the normal that's amount of time, time is that's a, a long couple time. of minutes. Yeah. It, was, it was not fun. And the reason he said, he goes, I've never seen anyone with such a hard jawbone. Um, it just, it was just holding on. And this was particularly surprising to me because I had bone loss because I used to have gum disease. So I thought of anything, it's going to slip out like that. I mean, I remember like dentists in the past, they were telling me, you know, this is one of the reasons I quit smoking back in my 20s because my back teeth were like, there was bone loss and they were loose and they were like, if you don't stop soon, they're literally going to fall out. I was like, oh God. So that was still in my head, right? This tooth is going to come out like nothing. But as a result of that mega dosing of K K2, um, it was, you know, he said the most um, <laughs> difficult <laughs> extraction uh, procedure that you'd ever have to do, that you'd ever, sorry, that you had ever done up until that point. So... <clears throat> I would say um, that is the only danger that I can think of. If there is a situation, let's say, you know, dental work, sometimes they even break the jaw, you know, for orthodontic purposes or whatever. So that's the only reason that I am aware of why very high doses of K2 might not be a good idea because you actually want to break a bone or pull something out of a bone. Um, but other than that, I, I don't see any downside to it. Yeah, I was going to ask if there were any contraindications or any other safety concerns, but I think you've answered that. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, as I said, with fat soil vitamins, now there's not enough research in this, but I'm just telling you the facts, right? That a few hundred milligrams of the MK7, no side effects that's been tested. And then even these massive doses of the MK4, no side effects that's been tested.